my students. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody. <laughs> to those of you who've just joined us and to people who are here for the AGM, my name is Mary Ann Stevenson. I'm director of the UK Women's Budget Group. Um, and welcome to our evening panel. It's really great to have you here. Um, this is the first hybrid event that we have organized. For the last 18 months, all of our events have been online. Um, so it's a, a kind of learning process for us as we move from, from entirely virtual to a combination of real world and virtual events. So please bear with us, we'll see how it goes. Um, we've got a great panel for you this evening. Um, what we wanted to do was really showcase two projects um, that we're running at the Women's Budget Group, which although they can in one way seem quite different, one is very much focused on the local and in the UK, and one is very much focused on the international, actually have a number of really strong links. Um, first of all, they're both projects that are about um, capacity building um, and supporting conversations around um, gender and the economy um, and gender budgeting in the case of the international work and um, in the case of the, the local project, access to data. But again, that data is used in order to um, analyze what's going on locally, to make calls for um, uh, different policy approaches um, and to critique the impact of policy approaches. So that is also a, a form of local um, gender budgeting work. Um, we've got a great panel here with us this evening. So from the Women's Budget Group staff team, um, on the panel, um, we have Emily Bell, who is our local training and partnerships coordinator at the Women's Budget Group. She leads on the local data project, which, um, as I said, aims to strengthen the capacity of local organisations to find data to evidence inequality within their local area and campaign for change, focusing on women's economic disadvantage. Um, and online, um, we have um, Hannah Abbott, who is a research and policy officer at the Women's Budget Group, who's working on the International Training and Partnerships Programme, working with civil society organisations to build capacity in analysing economic policy for a gender lens to promote gender responsive budgeting. Hannah was going to do a double act with Marion Sharples, who's the head of the International Training and Partnerships work, uh, but unfortunately Marion's not well today, so can't join us. Um, but we also have two other speakers representing organisations that we have been working with. Um, so um, on the panel, again, Fiona Armstrong Gibbs, um, who's a senior lecturer in the business school at Liverpool John Moores University, but is also a researcher with the One Group Day group of women activists who've been addressing the economic impact that women have in the Liverpool city region and how um, policy impacts on women, um, and who we've been working with um, for some time in different ways. Um, and online, we have um, Josiah Kayari, um, I don't know if you can see him on your screen, um, who is a research monitoring and evaluation officer at the Collaborative Centre for Gender and Development, which focuses on promoting gender responsive planning, advocacy and programming to policymakers at a national, um, county and regional levels in Kenya. And again, we've been working with the centre um, for since the beginning of the year. So it's great to hear from Josiah too. So I'm going to start um, at the local level um, with Emily, who is going to introduce the work of the Local Data Project. And then I'll hand over to Fiona who will talk about how that work has, has contributed to the work that the One Day Group has been doing. And then I will go to um, Hannah and Josiah and there'll be time for questions at the end. So first off, Emily. Yeah, the um, yes. Um, thank you, and I just want to reiterate my thanks to Tafisa for making this happen because I know she's working really hard, and I think this hybrid event um, has been a great success. So well done. Um, and I just want to say thank you for inviting me to speak on the panel two people I know independently met each other for the first time recently and their description of me was oh she really likes data <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really excited to be able to talk about it um, and I did actually have a whole presentation planned and I had fancy powerpoint slides and then I changed it all after I went to a presentation 
an inspiring presentation from the Office for National Statistics, which is perhaps not something that you would imagine. Um, but yesterday, they launched a report into um, their, the, the outcome of the, the task force that they commissioned to look at inclusive data. And I was so inspired by the things that they said that I thought I would change my presentation. Because one of the things that they said was that stories are powerful and we need to use them more. So I thought I would tell you a story if you forgive the indulgence. I'm going to talk about a friend of mine. So when I was younger, I uh, studied maths and my best friend studied English literature, which was quite odd because I think she had only ever read one book up until that time. But anyway, after the end of our studies, we both decided that we wanted to change direction. I went to teach English and she wanted to be a nurse. But the problem was that she hadn't passed her GCSE maths and she needed some help with that. So I, I helped her, I tutored her to pass her, her maths GCSE. And I knew she'd be fine because she was always much better at managing her pocket money than I was. Um, but she'd fallen into that trap that so many teenage girls do of thinking that she couldn't do maths because she was a girl. Well, she passed her exam, she went on to be a nurse, and then she became a nurse prescriber, which involves even more maths. So I was very, very proud of her. But fast forward a few years, and we both changed direction again. And she started her own business, and I went back to working with numbers. Now, I love helping people with numbers, but don't ask me to help you with a maths GCSE because it's been a long time and I have no idea what's on the exam anymore. So what else can I tell you about my friend? Well, I can tell you that um, being self-employed, she's quite unusual for a woman, uh, but also that being self-employed, she takes a salary home that is much less than a self-employed man. Um, I can tell you that in her region, the childcare costs that she has to pay amount to about 30% of her salary because she's got two kids who go to primary school and they have to go to an after school club so she can run her business effectively. Um, but this assumes that she has a salary and like you know, most of us during the lockdown periods, um, her, her work was affected and possibly more than most because her business was in the personal care sector. And we know that the personal care sector was one of those industries that was the hardest hit by the lockdowns. Coincidentally, it's also one of those industries that employs more women than men. Um, I'm not sure if she made a claim to uh, the government through their self-employment income support scheme. But if she did, she would have been one of 65% of eligible women in her local authority, compared to 71% of men who made claims during the same period. Now, the story of my friend is the story of many women. Um, and when you look at the numbers, you can see patterns now, none of the numbers that I've shared with you are actually difficult to find if you know where to look. And the calculations, those percentages that I've shared with you, they're not difficult to come to either if you have the right tools. So my job at the Local Data Project is to help you know where to look and to help make sure that you've got the right tools. But how does knowing these numbers affect change? What difference does it make? Well, the numbers I shared with you about my friend's life and her situation um, are based on the three briefings that we have published and will publish as part of the Local Data Project this year. Our first briefings on the gendered impact of the government's uh, coronavirus support scheme, which was written by my colleague Anna, and it is excellent. I recommend you read it. 
Um, the second one was on access to childcare, uh, written by my colleague Hannah, also excellent, and I recommend you read it. And the third one, which will be coming out later in the year, will focus on the gender pay gap and will help you to figure out what the gender pay gap is where you live. Fiona is probably going to speak a little bit more about um, employment and um, working with councils. I just want to say one thing about councils. Um, it's not unusual that they don't consider women. So, for example, um, I'm currently working with an organisation in another UK city to help them um, put together a profile of the economic situation for women in that city so that they can go to the council and say, look, this is what's missing from what you have come up with. Um, please, can you have another look? Let's take the childcare example. So whilst we were working on putting together the briefing on childcare, we were approached by an organisation, a group of women from one of the London boroughs, just down the road, who had done a little bit of research locally on the situation of childcare in their borough and um, asked if we could support them. So we did, we helped them to know what the situation was where they live. And they used that training from the local data project to add to what they already knew and to take it to their council. And that campaign is ongoing. So without using that gender response, uh, gender budgeting lens, we just wouldn't understand one of the key factors that prevents women from returning to work, which is the unaffordability of childcare. Um, but we're not just about briefings, we're also really happy to work with um, other groups or individuals who are interested in finding out about the economic situation for women where they are. And um, we're currently working with an organisation on the costs of violence against women in their local area. And they can use that data in their funding bits, because if you have that, those numbers for the local area, you can add that to your bid, you can add power to your request for money. You see, stories are powerful. I completely agree with the ONS and I agree they should use more stories. But numbers also tell a story and numbers have power. They have the power to open doors and they have the power to start conversations. And numbers belong to us all, whether you have a maths GCSE or not. So if you're interested in telling your story, and you want some numbers to back it up, just let me know. Thank you very much, Emily. That was that was brilliant. Um, and you're absolutely right about the power of stories and also using numbers to tell a story. Um, I'm going to move straight on to hear from Fiona now about the um, One Day Project in Liverpool. Thank you. Um, this is amazing to be here. Thank you very much for asking me. It's the first time that I've been back in London for work since March 2020. So yeah, I have been once to London since, but um, but yeah, so this is this is amazing to be back. So thank you very much. Um, so I am from uh, Liverpool, and this project is something that and Tabitha's actually in the, in the audience here with us as well. It's something that we've been working on in Liverpool for quite some years and it, it really started through um, devolution and when we got metro mayors and that I won't you know I won't go into that now but that's the political kind of context that we we sort of got this project we were interested in this project and we started off complaining that there weren't any women in leadership positions and the combined authority in that in that situation but we actually realized quite soon that um, that wasn't getting us very far. We were very frustrated and very annoyed that there were no women representing us, but we knew it wouldn't get anywhere. So we turned our attention to look at where they were spending the money that they got. And that's really where that, that came from. Um, and so um, about two years ago, just, just shy of two years ago, in fact, it was, I think, the 30th anniversary of the Women's Budget Group, 
um, Erica Rushton, who is one of the one of the core group, so put a Twitter call out and said, right, we're really furious that there's millions of pounds being spent in our region. That was part of the devolution deal, um, 30 million a year plus, you know, a lot of other money. Um, and it seems to all be going on construction sites and, and, you know, jobs that businesses that are owned by men and jobs for men, really. And there was very little. And there, there's some, you know, it was there for infrastructure build. But as we already alluded to today, social infrastructure is actually um probably equally if not more important as bricks and mortar so we started asking the questions where's this money going and who's getting it and and who's you know who's benefiting from it and we came up with some you know with some startling figures that around 90 percent of the money that was being spent was being spent on men's businesses and jobs that employ men which is just eye-watering when you think about the kind of cascade effect that that then has on women so we, we wrote an initial kind of, we came together for a day, we wrote an initial set of, of really sort of, you know, ideas, thinking, you know, things that we wanted. Um, and the combined authority were, were quite keen to work with us on it. And we, we had a launch event and then um, the pandemic hit. So we, we launched it on International Women's Day 2020. And then not long after that, the world completely changed. Um, but what was really interesting about what we'd identified um, with the kind, you know, with the doc, a lot of the documents, a lot of the information that had been that we'd seen on the Women's Budget Group website, was that actually care, social care, child care, um, jobs predominantly done by women, were then we predicted in our report that it needed much, much, much more um, investment. As we then saw with the pandemic, they were the most hazardous and the least paid jobs. So it really kind of you know gained gain traction with us and I, I also work at John Moore's University and I was really fortunate to then be able to because we'd already done some sort of grassroots work we would had access to some of the data and some of the ideas albeit at national level um, it was an appealing project for the university to fund so I got a small amount of money to be able to um, employ a research assistant to help me then I, Started, we started doing a lot more work with Emily around, you know, drilling down into local data. And if we couldn't find it, then at least we could say we want this local data, but we can't find it. Um, so we worked for about six months. Um, we went back to the original women. We sort of drew the net wider. We contacted people that had come to our events. And incredibly, everyone was so willing and keen and excited to, to contribute their thinking to it. And we had over 65 women, 100 women, um, come to a zoom event in march 2021 which we know by then we were all absolutely exhausted with you know with doing that and we were desperate to see each other but still keen so we collected a lot more data a lot more kind of stories a lot more kind of evidence and um along with the reports that were coming out i can't wait to go and see them for in, in my hands over there along with some of those reports we, we put together 10 key objectives so we, we kind of revisited the original report, put together 10 key objectives. I don't know if the slide is, is, on, um, is on there. Um, so that's, that's who we now are. So we've got a, a brilliant graphics. We, we, we were able to employ a young um, graduate from LJMU to do our graphics for us. Um, and as I say, a research assistant as well. So I feel like we kind of practiced what we preached and what we spent, spent the money on as well, a local um, copywriting and editing company as well. So um, the report is now, I think, on, on your website, on the blog, but we really now see ourselves as a civic group formed to improve inclusive growth in the Liverpool city region. Um, and the specific aim of what we do is to, you know, increase that visibility of women um, and advocate for change, really. Um, if you go on to the next slide, it really just outlines what we saw were the problems, really. So we think that there were problems politically when there was actually, you know, that lack of representation. That's changing. And if you read the report, the blog or any of it, it seems to, it's, it's you know, we've changed that. We've now got two women who are council leaders in, in the authorities. So they've joined. Um, so that's, you know, that's phenomenal for us. But what we're seeing as well is economically, you know, the ca those capital investments, we need to think long term about investing in women led projects and how we align a lot of that to what, you know, to, to the work that women do as well. Um, but one of the most important things, one of the most powerful things, we've got loads of stories and I'm a, I, I love a story. I, that would be, that's my, you know, that's my research approach is through stories, but actually the data gives it so much more depth to be able to be kind of, 
you need both to be able to tell your real story and to have that impact. And we did this, we did a, a, you know, the, the local data project with Emily and we looked at the impact furlough and the statistics, you know, I'm sure you, you know, you're well aware of them. It's in the report, our, our part of page 4042, but, um, you know, even with the social, with um, self-employment, 2,000 women claimed around 2,000 pounds, men in the region claimed 2,800 pounds. So just that as a multiplier effect, just, you know, the types of um, furlough clearly affected women more than men. The more women who work in retail and hospitality, particularly in Liverpool, were a business or economy based. You know, so we know that there were a lot of young women that we dealt with that were affected by that. So we know this is all, it's really powerful data that's gone into that report, which we wouldn't have been able to do without the Women's Budget Group. Budget group. Um, and then on the next slide, I've just, uh, it's not a great slide, but you can, and I don't know if you can read it, but these are our 10 key objectives. And what we did, in, instead of just putting a wish list together of what we wanted, we actually put an objective and then measurement of a key result. So within the report, you'll see the first. So, for example, the first um, one is we want more women in leadership and more diverse representation in all civic duties. And then we've made three key results that we'll go back and we'll measure, you know, we'll ask the combined authority, did you do this? Why didn't you do it? What happened? How can we help you? What else do you need? And we'll work together with them to try and deliver those key results. And I had a meeting with the um, head of policy with the combined authority today. And they're really pleased with that kind of approach because it's a starting point for us to be able to work together. You know, we know where we both, we, 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 it's kind of not, it's beyond a wish list really. It's, it's kind of, but that, you can make those, you can measure things if you start to put those things in place. So, um, so that's really, I mean, that's that's really what the report was. Um, the final slide is just a full illustration because we, we, really, we really like this, we really like this illustration. But, um, and I think, I suppose, what I have been overwhelmingly um, surprised and impressed and delighted by how many people want to be a part of this. Mm. It doesn't feel like it. Some days, are, you know, are hard and we get angry. Um, but actually, more there's a many, many more open doors than there are closed doors, actually. There's much more, many more people, whether it be in the university, whether it be local MPs, councillors, media, the BBC, we've got a great, you know, we've got a great ally at the BBC who will report on something for us. And um, because our group is wide and quite a diverse mix of women, we've connected beyond that as well. And, and sometimes that can be quite difficult, you know, bringing people on board with you. But I think we've managed to do it so far and hopefully we'll, we will continue to do it. So. Thank you so much for that Fiona, that was really, really inspiring. You know, it's really fabulous to, to see this sort of work having an impact at the local level and particularly I think at a time when it can be quite difficult to get much movement from national government. I think it's really important to recognise that there's, you know, there's a huge amount that can be done locally and that we can, you know, even if you're banging your head against one door, maybe there's another door that might be a bit more open, a bit more pushing. So um, that's that's really great. So we're going to move on now um, from the, the very kind of specific and local in the UK to, to the international and the work that we're doing there. Um, and first, I'm going to invite Hannah to um, speak about the um, International um, Partnerships and Learning Project. Hannah, are you with us? I am. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to have the chance to speak to you about our Global Partnerships and Learning Programme, or GPL for short. Um, I think Tafizam is going to share her screen so that you can see some slides that we've put together. Well, while we're waiting, before I get started, I do want to echo Marianne and Emily in thanking Tafisa for all of her hard work organising our first hybrid event and for sharing my slides. There we are. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to speak to you very, very briefly about our GPL programme and what we've been up to this year. Um, next slide, please, Tafisa. 
So we launched the GPL at program at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've got funding from the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, which is currently guaranteed for 18 months. So that takes us up until June 2022. So we're about halfway through now. Before we had specific funding to set up this program, the Women's Budget Group would carry out international work on an ad hoc basis, responding to any requests we'd received depending on capacity and availability. So our Global Partnerships and Learning Programme is partly a formalisation of this work that was already taking place. Next slide, please. A significant part of the early stages of this programme involved reflecting on how we can make it compatible with our ambitions to decolonise, to shift power, and to be deliberately and explicitly anti-racist in our ways of working. So this involved a lot of internal reflection on our positionality as an organisation comfortably situated in the mainstream feminist movement in the UK, um, in the global north, working internationally with organisations, some of them coming from the global south, and really not wanting to, add, to do any harm in the ways that we work. So as a result, we committed to principles of work based on collaboration, on flexibility, sustainability and solidarity. So these are the values that make up the programme and the ways that we work. So what these mean for us when we say collaboration, we recognise that the traditional training model can often imply a hierarchy between the expert trainer and the participants. So we've committed to using collaborative and participatory training methods, as well as working in collaboration with our partner organizations from the very start um, and being aware of these power dynamics and trying to create a space where participants can drive and direct the content of the training so they can really get what they need from it. We want to facilitate spaces where groups and individuals who are committed to women's movements in all of their diversity can come together and share knowledge and support one another and build long lasting relationships which are founded on exchange and international solidarity that we don't necessarily have to be in the room for, we can just leave and those relationships can continue beyond the life of the training. When we talk about flexibility, we recognize that there really isn't a one size fits all approach for training and it really doesn't work when you look at it from that perspective. So we take the time to build in um, the space and time required to understand the objectives and the needs of our partner organizations. And we try to create a session that is as bespoke as possible, as well as recognizing the limits of our knowledge and expertise. So to put it simply, we will only work where we think we can make a positive contribution. If we don't think we can, then we just won't take it on. For sustainability, we really want to make sure that the knowledge and the learnings that are generated in training sessions is kept and owned by our partners. And our goal is ultimately to eliminate our role as trainer. So for example, we do this through our training for trainer sessions and also by sharing our resources with our partners, as well as sharing our trainer specific resources with our trainers as well. And all of this is because we would like to say that we stand in solidarity with our partner organizations who want to hold their own governments to account to promote budgets and policies that will bring about gender equality. So we recognize that only a global feminist movement can bring about the changes that we all need. And as we live in an increasingly globalized world, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners and allies across the globe. So these are really the values that went into the program right at the beginning we spent a good three months reflecting and coming up with these um next slide please Tafisa. so since then um we have delivered 10 training and consultation sessions um some have involved training on the more technical aspects of gender responsive budgeting others have been more focused on the different aspects of setting up and maintaining a network including trainings on communication strategies, on social media strategies, on fundraising, and also around research methods. It's also important to note that these are all trainings that have been um, 
delivered with uh, to organizations that have approached us asking for training and support so we're really responding to a need and a demand that is already there we haven't approached any organizations and asked them if they want any training next slide please Tafiza. Uh, at the moment we're working with partners in sierra leone in kenya in Greece and an organization which is based in the US but working to bring gender responsive budgeting to the Iranian context. I'm really delighted that we have Josiah Kiari from the CCGD joining us on the panel this evening. He's going to talk to you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing together in Kenya. And um, the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development is our longest standing partner. Uh, next slide please Tafiza. So once we'd established the program values and started delivering some training sessions, we recruited a pool of 12 freelance gender responsive budgeting trainers. The idea is that as and when we receive requests and training opportunities, we will recruit from this pool of experts who are based across different parts of the world to plan and deliver training sessions in collaboration with us at the Women's Budget Group. In this way, we hope to be able to expand our network, we get to meet new people, and most interestingly for me, we get to learn so much about what other feminist activists are doing in different contexts. Uh, next slide, please, Tafiza. Um, so just to talk to you a little bit more specifically about the work that we're doing in Greece, we're currently working with ActionAid Hellas and Karditsa Women's Center, who are two organizations who have established relationships with two municipal governments one in Athens and one in Karditsa. They've been doing all of this work to uh, bring community voices into the participatory budget process at municipal level. So this work was already going on for several months. We worked with them to develop and deliver training. I think, sorry, someone might have unmuted by accident, just wait. Thank you. Um, we worked with them to deliver and uh, to develop and deliver training for local government officials from both these municipalities on what gender responsive budgeting is and how it can be used. So it's quite a technical training session. Feedback we collected during the session in June showed us that most people who attended felt much more confident about gender responsive budgeting after the training. And 70% of attendees indicated that they would definitely attend follow-up sessions. So this is what we're doing now. We're working with our partners in Greece to plan follow-up training for local government officials. And our next training will hopefully take place in early December. That's when it's scheduled for. Uh, next slide, please, Tafiza. So it really has been a very exciting time for us, myself and my colleague, Marion Sharples, who leads on our international work, but couldn't be with us this evening, unfortunately. We've really enjoyed working on this program so far, and we've really learned so much about our partners, about other contexts, and about training in general. We've developed long-term partnerships with nearly all the organizations who we have delivered training to so far. It's taught us that it's much more useful and valuable to nurture long-term relationships and deliver multiple short training sessions than simply flying in for one day, overwhelming people with information, and then leaving again. Although obviously we are not flying anywhere at the moment, everything has been delivered virtually. Um, we've also learned that we aren't the only experts. So just because the Women's Budget Group has 30 years of experience in the UK, it's really important to meet people wherever they're at in their process. People are already experts in the work that they're doing and it's our role as an organization to support them in that journey. And to go back to the program values, we have been relying on participatory training methods to do all of the above, to create spaces where our partners direct the training and take what they need from it, and then hopefully leave us behind, but definitely stay in touch. Uh, next slide, please, Tafiza. So to speak a little bit on our future plans, we are continuing our work with partners in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, in Greece, and in the US. We will be participating in a webinar held by an organization based in Sweden uh, called Kavina Till Kavina. They're working in the MENA region, specifically in Tunisia and Jordan uh, on gender responsive budgeting to these uh, contexts. We are also planning to hold regular webinars on gender responsive budgeting, which will be open to the public. And the aim of these is to deliver an introduction to 
gender responsive budgeting to a more general audience. Um, yep, next slide please, Tafisa. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for listening. And if you'd like to talk any more about the program or any of the work that we're doing, please don't hesitate to get in touch with either myself or Marion. And all of our more about the program is also on our website. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Josiah now so he can talk to you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing together. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hannah. I mean, as with the local data projects, it's really difficult to remember that, really difficult to remember that these projects only started in January this year and they've both got, you know, so well established and done such brilliant work. So last, but by no means least, I'm, I'm delighted um, to welcome Josiah here from Kenya, um, who is joining us online, talking about um, his work at the Collaborative Centre for Gender and Development. Over to you, Josiah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Stephenson, and uh, thank you, Hannah, once again, and the entire WDG team for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here and share my experience with gender responsive budgeting and um, our work with the uh, WBG. So, so um, Tafiza will be putting up some slides, but just before the slides come up, just like to talk to you about my own experience with the gender responsive budgeting. I, um, at the start of, uh, at the end of last year, I got a new job with the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development. And I had no idea what gender responsive budgeting is, but the director called me one day and asked me what I know about budgets. And uh, I told him that one thing they have to be gender desegregated, that you have targets and you have to know how many women and men you're reaching with your program. And uh, he told me that uh, there is an initiative that has been the Achilles heel at the center. And uh, he would like me to, uh, to sort of coordinate it. And he told me that it's gender responsive budgeting. And uh, that was it. I went to online and thanks to Google, I Googled what gender responsive budgeting is read a couple of reports and uh, writing about gender responsive budgeting and uh, went on LinkedIn and looked such for organizations and people who are into gender responsive budgeting. And I came across Marion Chapels and uh, I sent a message on LinkedIn and uh, we, stru we struck a conversation that has led up to this, this, this meeting today. And I'm so glad to be here to just explain uh, what we have been doing, both at the, uh, as the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development and, uh, as, uh, uh, and with the Gender Responsive Budgeting uh, Initiatives as well. So next, next slide, please. Yeah, so our story, the Collaborative Center for Gender and uh, Development is uh, it's a Kenyan NGO and uh, it's, uh, it was formed in 1996, uh, mainly comprises of uh, researchers, academics, uh, and, and, and who had an interest in, uh, in advocating for social and economic justice. So one of the things that uh, they, they, they felt would uh, uh, lead to that goal was the issue of gender responsive budgeting. And uh, we have been working on it for, 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 for quite some time, but it has really not caught foot and uh, not much has been taken up by, by the government in terms of gender responsive budgeting. Next slide. So that is where we are, that's the map of Africa. If you look at the purple area, that's, that's Kenya. And some of our work spills over to the neighboring countries in East Africa. Next slide. So uh, Collaborative Center for Gender and Development, uh, a national NGO, we work with, uh, with governments and in and different sectors. Uh, so, so, and task forces. So our work, we, we, want, we involve the government in our interventions, uh, mainly raising issues to them and also working with them uh, to find solutions for those issues. Where capacity is a problem, we also step in and support uh, government on certain capacity, uh, and in this case, gender responsive budgeting. We also work at the sub-national level, um, 
Kenya, Kenya has a system of governments where you have the national government and then you have regional governments at uh, a sub-national level. And, and this is where majority of the services are offered. So uh, after we got the 2010 constitution uh, that gave uh, this provision for regional governments, slowly these uh, governments have been uh, uh, tasked with, with, with providing critical services uh, in health, in education, in water and sanitation. So we are also stepping in to work with them and ensure that uh, they offer services in, in a way that uh, doesn't disadvantage uh, women, uh, men, boys and girls. Next slide. So the Kenya Gender Budget Network um, is the Achilles heel of, of, of the, the center. Uh, there have been many trials uh, to set it up and get it running. Uh, so we have been hosting it for quite some time now, but it's only uh, recently that uh, we are starting to see uh, uh, some promise in the way that it works. So it is a, it is a, it's a net, it's a budgeting network fashioned in the same way that WBG is, is fashioned and bringing in uh, members of the academia, researchers and civil society to advocate uh, for gender responsive budgeting. So objectives of the Kenya Budgeting Network is to advocate for gender forecast programming uh, but, but, and budgeting by governments. Uh, that will include the policies and laws at national and the county level, which is the sub-national level uh, of, of the government also to enhance uh, skills, technical skills and expertise in GRB, and also to increase uh, public awareness uh, about uh, GRB and uh, what, what issues uh, that really people uh, should be concerned about um, uh, and just bring it uh, to, to in, a, in a simple manner, in a way that they, uh, gives power to the people to advocate for, for better services. Next slide. So our collaboration with the uh, WBG, as, as Hannah mentioned, um, after the messages on LinkedIn with, uh, with, 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 with Marion um, culminated to a series of uh, uh, activities with WBG that we are really uh, proud about and, and, and I'm excited to highlight some of this. One is that we've had uh, capacity building and, and, and sort of planning sessions. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we, we want right now, because our vision is to have the Kenya Gender Budgeting Network as an autonomous uh, uh, group or organization or entity different from the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development. We are only hosting um, the network, but we would want a network that is able to engage uh, by itself with other actors out there. So. We've uh, had a session on fundraising um, with, the, with the WBG uh, and, 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 and uh, Hannah and Marion shared resources with us uh, that built our capacity in what uh, we should really look for when fundraising. And uh, this is greatly appreciated. We also had a webinar in March of this year on the COVID-19 impacts uh, on gender responsive budgeting, and uh, we, were, we were very uh, glad to, ho to host Dr. Marianne Stephenson as one of the key speakers uh, in this event. We also have had uh, participation from government officials, uh, uh, and, and really this webinar sort of brought uh, uh, key, key, key people involved in the process of, of, of budgeting in, in government to have a conversation about uh, gender responsive uh, budgeting. And we are glad that from that uh, webinar, we've had, uh, we created um, uh, networks uh, with, with sub-national uh, level uh, budget actors and those who form uh, part of our target uh, audiences with the follow-up actions on, 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 on gender responsive budgeting. So that was a positive outcome from uh, that webinar. So the other thing uh, we, we achieved was the co-authoring of, of the joint blog on uh, gender responsive budgeting in COVID times. That is the, uh, a comparison of the experiences of the UK and, and Kenya uh, in terms of gender responsive, uh, responsive budgeting, mainly highlighting the highs and the lows and also uh, giving some recommendations on, on how to go forward. We also uh, got support uh, to uh, analyze the 2021 budget in, in Kenya 
and uh, we'll, it's work in progress and will be shared uh, probably in the next two weeks or so. And we have some very great insights uh, uh, from WBG on the areas to look out for and how we should present the, the budget brief. So that's some exciting uh, product that will come out of this collaboration and we will be glad to share it. Next slide. So some of the issues that we're grappling with uh, in Kenya in terms of, uh, with regards to uh, gender responsive budgeting. One is the inadequate uh, capacity among officers to undertake GRB. This has been cited several times. Uh, you, we have uh, officers tasked with uh, budgeting, but the concept of uh, GRB is not understood and how to go uh, uh, about it as well. Part of it has to do with the tools, um, and 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 the capacity that 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 is that is lacking. Um, so so this is an area actually that we want to look into and see how best uh, do we uh, guide the, the the budget actors, the, the people, the technical people in charge of budgets, uh, but provide them with the right information and the right tools uh, to be able to undertake GRB. And the other um, uh, challenge is the absence of gender disagree disaggregated data in most cases. Most of the ministries, uh, most of government, government departments do not uh, keep gender disaggregated statistics. And this has been a great problem uh, that, 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 that has impeded uh, the practice of GRB. So on one hand, uh, the government uh, may not know how much of, of, of the initiatives that are put in place and the impact on, on this on, on, on men and women. Perhaps they could be doing positive things, but they do not understand. The other thing, we don't know uh, what, what they're doing uh, uh, in terms of impact. And, 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 and uh, it, it's evident if you look at um, uh, the budget allocations, even in this analysis that we are doing, uh, given to sectors that would support uh, women economic empowerment, and in this case, the care economy, you realize that uh, over several years, there's, there, have, have, there, 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 have, there has been a decrease in some of those sectors. So, so it's, it's a problem that uh, we, we hope in future to have conversations about it and just to strategize how we can go about uh, data. So the other thing is the uncoordinated voice of civil society actors uh, in advocating for GRB. We have uh, um, different campaigns from different quarters in the civil society about uh, gender responsive budgeting and uh, but the budgeting process as a, whole, as a whole, but it's uncoordinated. And that's the gap we want to fill in with the, with the Kenya Gender Budgeting Network, uh, bring these uh, actors on one table and uh, we can have a joint and a coordinated voice that would be effective in engaging with government. Last uh, is lack of political will. Uh, uh, I think several, for several years now, there's the, been the push for uh, gender responsive budgeting. Uh, we have a commission called the National Gender and Equality Commission that has published guidelines to do uh, uh, gender responsive budgeting. But these uh, deadlines are, are largely not, not, not followed uh, by, by, by governments. Uh, so so uh, just the general lack of will uh, has been lacking, but uh, I believe with a more coordinated the network of uh, actors uh, from, from different academics, uh, different sectors, different fields, uh, we will be able to uh, make it a case for gender responsive budgeting. Next slide. So our plans going forward is to, as I said, enhance the coordination of the, of the, of, of the different actors uh, for sustained advocacy for, for GRB. And we will do this through the Kenya Gender Budgeting Network. Already we have uh, started conversations with the different entities, universities and civil societies uh, who form the basis of the membership of the Kenya Gender Budgeting Network. And we believe that uh, this, 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 this will, uh, uh, put an impetus in the in the in the advocacy for uh, gender responsive budgeting. Uh, the other thing we're doing is uh, to uh, build the capacity uh, of state actors to uh, identify opportunities for GRB 
in the budget. Uh, currently, the budget process for 2023 and 2024 here is, is, is ongoing. And uh, we will have a series of webinars with uh, different budget offices uh, so that to identify these opportunities. Just bring in the te technical expertise of uh, uh, in, in budgeting and also gender responsive budgeting and, and, and have a conversation uh, to support this process. So the other thing we want to do is to establish a, a secretariat for KGBN so that it's more uh, autonomous and, and able to stand on its own uh, and, 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 and uh, um, advocate and, and conduct its, its work. Um, the last but not least is, is, is the collaboration because uh, we realize, as, as Hannah said, that uh, uh, the sol solidarity is important for all of us here. When injustice happens in one part of the world, it should concern us, uh, us all. So we are concerned that uh, our country is not uh, budgeting in a responsive way. And we are very glad for the assistance that uh, WGPG has given, given us, uh, realizing the value of solidarity and you know, having a coordinated international movement of GRB. And we are very grateful for that. Uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Josiah. That was really, again, incredibly inspirational to see to see what's been going on, um, and and wonderful to feel that the Women's Budget Group has been able to be a part of that. Um, so I hope that's given an idea of the kind of range of the Women's Budget Group work, you know, I mean, we're still probably best known in the UK for our kind of response to the budget every year, but you can actually see that this sort of work, which is, is not just about carrying out the analysis, but is about, you know, working with others to help build capacity and provide support so that other people can do their own analysis and work so that we are able to contribute to a wider movement, both at a local level and a national level. And that, that's something that I'll I think we should be incredibly proud of as an organisation. So you've heard a lot of different things. I'm sure there's lots of different um, questions and comments and things that people would like to ask. What I'm going to do is I will keep an eye on the audience in the room. Tafisa, can you keep an eye on <laughs> who's got their hand up on the screens? Because I'm not going to be able to see that. So if you want to um, ask a question, probably if you're online, the best thing to do is to use the raise hand function, which means your name, the hand will come up next to your name and Tabisa can keep an eye on that. If you are in the room, anybody who's in the room, who I know is probably feeling quite cold because it's really cold <laughs> in here, sorry about that. Um, uh, anybody here would like to ask a question or has got a comment or anything they would like to say? So frozen to their chair already. <laughs> Sue. Um, should I come up there? Yes, yeah. would you mind? Because then people can yeah. see you as well. I was struck by something that can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I was struck by something that I think um, is an issue both in the local data project and might be one in the um, international one too. And I wonder to what extent, when you think that the gender-based data is not available, do you mean that it's not collected or that it's not published? Because in the area that I work on, on tax, I know that the data is collected and I just, you just can't get it out of, out of the authorities because, it, because nothing is ever published in that form. That's a really good question. I'm just going to see if there's any others before I go to the panel to come back on that. Is there anything in the room to feed? Have we got anything on the screen? No, everyone's blown away by those presentations. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the panel and I think I'll start with um, Fiona and Josiah because you're the ones who are doing the work. Do you think it's a problem that the data isn't being collected or that it's just not being made available? Well, I think it's probably both, isn't it? I think there's, I think, I think a lot of it now because of the digital access that we have to things. I think the data is there. Um, it's just not, you know, broken down by the characteristics or, or, or you know, gender. It's not disaggregated as we would need it to, and that may just be 
I mean, I, I you know, I see gender blindness, blah, blah, gender blindness um, constantly in decision making all the time. Um, and I think it's probably just it hasn't been pointed out. It hasn't been said. Have you checked that and that? Um, if it was pointed out and it was made more explicit, I think it would be published because I think it, it's interesting. People love to have comments on things. They love interpreting things. They love to share their opinions on things. I think if there was more information made available, they would we'd be able to have a discussion about it. Just so what's the situation in Kenya? Is, is the data being collected and not published or is it simply not being collected? Do you, do you know? Thank you very much. It's, that's a very important question. I think it's both uh, in our country. And what is being collected, uh, sometimes it's not, it, it's not enough. Uh, for instance, I know that uh, the Ministry of Education collects data because um, the education is, is, is about um, educating both men and women. And, and so they have this data of boys and girls. But you have sectors, uh, other very critical sectors like agriculture that don't disaggregate the data. I was looking at reports and, and, and they were talking about we have uh, assisted 300, 400 farmers. So they are collecting it, but it's not disaggregated uh, into um, the this, this specific uh, uh, gender or different characteristics of people. And this is this this is why um, um, it, it concerns us that when this is not happening, then we are not able to uh, quantify what's happening, um, um, the impact of these these government projects, uh, and 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 just to ascertain how they affect men and and, and women differently. So so it's a case of both. Uh, they collect it; it's not disaggregated, um, um, and 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 therefore does not does not inform uh, gender responsive budgeting. Thank you. Emily, uh, the um, inclusive um, uh, MNS inclusive data project launched yesterday. This was something that they talked yeah. about quite a bit. Do you want to say yeah. something about that yeah. over there? Yeah. You might as well stand up. Yes. Um, yeah. So a couple of things to say. One. Um, the, the furlough data that we worked with on our first briefing, um, that data was not disaggregated until we asked for it. So yes, it was collected, but it wasn't published. So yes, there is data that's collected and not published. Um, and it's knowing who to ask, I think, is, is part of the issue. Um, but like mary Ann said, at the report launch yesterday, the ONS um, did admit that they can do a lot better on this and so this inclusive data report that they presented yesterday um, included a, a promise of a work plan going forward where they will publish more disaggregated data and fingers crossed um, also at a more local geographic level as well so um, I would like you know personally for the WBG to take uh, the credit for that, for the local data project pushing the <laughs> ONS. <to publish. laughs> um, yeah, so hopefully that, that will improve. Thank you. Anna, have you got anything to add on this question of data? Um, not too much, but that part of the, this is something that we consider when we are planning our training and, and advisory sessions is that we always uh, talk to organize, partner organizations about where their data doesn't where the data doesn't exist maybe part of the resource and the energy could be spent lobbying to have that data collected or have that data published so this is something that we definitely take into consideration but we don't know all of the answers okay thank you any other questions any other questions from the room do you, do you want to come up so that people but online can I see you? I don't know, I don't know what the, the, the new uh, technology allows, but indeed, uh, I think sometimes it feels like the, the neglect of, of publishing data that is aggregated. Um, was about having to you know, create tables and, and do it and, and then selecting which, which matters most, but it seems now that we can actually almost have a user directed uh, data request. And I wonder whether, I'm, I'm sure the ONS has the tools and maybe other countries or other cities or could, could make it almost um, automatic for people to then decide what they want to date from, from uh, and that, that might be, but I don't know if there is talk, there are talks about that or, or um, that they feel that it's about, you know, 
privacy issues and whatnot, but maybe that's something to explore. Excellent. Jay, do you want to come up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to dig a little deeper into the meaning of disaggregated because it's not infrequent to see statistics which give men and women and then you find out that the women's amount of income for example is derived from household income split equally between the man and woman and that is a sort of false disaggregation that we need to be aware of and avoid I think that's a really good point. I mean, it's particularly difficult when you're looking at things like um, uh, household benefits, like universal credit, where it's very difficult to work out, you know, how do you assign it? Do you assign it to a person in whose name, who is the primary claimant, or do you assign it to both partners equally? We know that money isn't shared equally within households. Um, so I, I think that's that's really important. I don't know if anybody on the panel has got a, a comment on that. Is that something that you've been looking at in Liverpool? If actually, it was something that we wanted to look at. And I, I suppose this is the beginning of our journey, really start to drill down into the data. And I think the combined authority are happy to work with us on that as well. I think hopefully it'll be a collaboration that we do. So the things like what access, what, what data they do currently have, now I think they're going to be keener to start to drill down into that than maybe they have because they know they've got support of you know yourselves us and that that's where sometimes these things are really difficult to start and if it's just you trying to dig and tackle things it becomes really difficult whereas if there's three or four different types of people asking similar questions and the same thing it becomes more it becomes an easier thing to share the problem is shared then isn't it so I think it's the beginning of our journey on things like that definitely I'm just going to say as well, it's about power, you know, mm. what I was talking about before. There, there are issues around who decides what to count and who decides what's counted. And those things are, you know, obviously part of data collection. So that, that has to be acknowledged, absolutely. Um, and you can, you can get numbers for women. Um, and we're not one big homogenous group, are we? So disaggregating even further is even more difficult. So finding that intersectional ana analysis is even harder to do. And yeah, uh, part of my daily um, job is like shouting at my computer because I can't find the data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. It's something that we need to advocate for, like Hannah said. Um, you know, I just advocate for change. It is possible. The, the census this last last time uh, this year, sorry, time's got weird. Um, the, the questions changed because um, groups advocated for the questions to change. So it might be a slow process and it might feel like it's a really uphill battle, but I think we can advocate for better data collection. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Sophie, are there any other questions coming in on the? I can't. I can't read them. Can you? I'm really, I'm really sorry, Sophie. I can't hear. Yes. It says, in my experience, data is kept in silos in government. It's not just civil society that doesn't have access to disaggregated data. Many officials don't have easy access to data that statistical office has collected. And another comment, um, good point about intra-household disaggregation. It's worth investigating. Uh, well done on both projects, they sound amazing. Thank you, that's great to hear. Um, Josiah, I, I wanted to ask you actually um, about this question of, of intersectional data because it's something that comes up for us a lot at the Women's Budget Group, um, where you, 
where you do get data, it will quite often be broken down to you'll see men and women, and then you'll have a separate section that will be on ethnicity, and then you'll have a separate section that is on disability. And, but you can't look at the, the interrelationships between them. Um, is, is that an issue that you face in Kenya as well? Uh, I don't just just come up come up again once more. Um, I'm sorry. Just, so I, just what, I was, what I was saying was this this question of, of intersectional data. So in the UK, um, it's quite common to see data that is broken down. Say first between men and women, and then you'll get something about um, ethnic origin, and then you'll get something about disability um, or income sometimes. But each each different characteristic is looked at separately. And it's quite hard to get the data in a way that allows you, for example, to look at the particular experience of black women compared to white men. Or um, is that a, is that also a problem in Kenya? Absolutely, absolutely, it's 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 a problem. Um, well, as you say, we, we might uh, um, get data on perhaps the number of uh, persons living with disability, mm -hmm. and. Uh, like an example, uh, and then you will have, you, you don't know where, wh wh whether they're from, um, as you say, dif di different, uh, in here we call them tribes, but really uh, it's just an ethnicities. You wouldn't know uh, from which ethnicity they are from. In some cases, you might not even know their gender. There will just be uh, persons living with disability, 300. You don't know whether they are male or female. Um, so it's it's an issue, and 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 as you mentioned, you would not you would not know um, who are most affected uh, from which region, uh, from from which uh, city, or uh, and so forth. So uh, it's 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 really uh, a problem uh, where intersectionalities are concerned uh, in terms of data as well. And then for us, I think it's a bigger problem because uh, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, you also have uh, ministries that don't keep the kind of disaggregation basic um, um, as, as male and female. So it, it's a huge problem, but uh, I believe with sustained advocacy uh, and, and more conversation with ministries, uh, th this, this, this problem will be solved. I, I, I was giving the example earlier of the Ministry of Education and because there was a, a lot of interest in how many girls are being educated, um, it's one of the best uh, ministries, I think, in terms of practice for disaggregating data. But even what they disaggregate uh, mostly is, is, is number of girls and, and number, number of boys. Um, if you move further to other uh, population characteristics, you will still find, find, find gaps along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sue. Oh, it's not there. Here you go. Here you go. Um, I raised that issue because I think we often talk about data not being collected. And that isn't really what we mean. We mean that it's not made available in the forms that we want. And I think it's important, the distinction is important because we're actually asking statistical authorities or governments or whoever it is to do quite different things. If we're asking them to go and collect data they haven't got, that's a really big thing. It's a costly thing to do. But if it's a case of making available data so that we can disaggregate it or asking them to disaggregate it in some way, that's not something that costs a lot of money. Um, and the arguments that will be against it will probably be things to do with privacy or, and we have to develop different types of arguments ourselves for doing it, if it's that. So I think it's important we don't, we don't keep saying the data isn't collected when it isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we're much clearer about it's actually, it's actually being kept from us. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, and that, you know, actually, this is our data, you yeah. know, and, and government statistical agencies are working on our behalf, um, so they should be doing these things. Um, I wanted to ask um, Fiona and Josiah what um, advice you might have for another organisation wanting to do something similar to you. 
So, Fiona, you know, if somebody came along and said, we love what you're doing in Liverpool in one day and we are based in, you know, Sheffield or Manchester or Exeter or wherever, um, how, how would you go about it? What would you do? What would you say to them? I suppose there's, there's a couple of different things really. Is every region is different and it has its own nuances. It has its own way of forming its, its kind of communities and alliances and whatever. So, um, it's not you can't use that cookie cutter approach and you know and say we did it this way so you must do that. So I think it's having confidence in your own community strengths and knowing where you're, what you're good at and what what you're active about already. But one of the most important things is knowing what bit of money you're interested in 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 kind of discovering more. So in our case we we. It, we had parameters, it's the combined authority, it's devolution, it's around the money that's spent um, across six boroughs and the decisions that are made around skills, um, they've got various various um, things that they've got budget for, so skills, infrastructure, transport, um, economic growth, so we, we've done our homework and we understand what we're, what we're trying to challenge them with and on um, and not everywhere will have a devolved government they won't have the same uh, budgets that spent on things they might have more they might have less so it's about working out which what don't want to use the word um fight but it's who do you what who are you going up against and what what is it you want to work out first of all and, and understanding where that money comes from and what conditions are put to that fund or, or something so a bit of homework around the sort of political and economic structures that you're trying to discover more about and you know that you might need help with that and it might take a bit of time one of the biggest challenges i think for us is is the, is the time it takes and and we're all voluntary in this you know as most of us are um, so that part of money that we got from the university was so important to us because it legitimized what we were doing. So I would also then say, well, who have you got that allies in your area? So do you have researchers at a local university that could could work on you with some of this? Universities are really looking to work much more in, into community kind of work. They're looking for you know ways of creating impact in their in their regions as well. They're not all looking for really high profile research. A lot of civic universities particularly interested in this kind of thing so there could be somebody at your local university that would be really excited to get involved with this as well your local MP it might really chime with what they're particularly interested in we did so for our summer government she was particularly this is her area this is what makes her really tick so your local MP might well be believe in this but 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 needs a kind of you know civic group to push it she or he may well champion you in their world, but they need you to kind of collect the data and tell the stories, and then they'll fly with that. So there's all different ways that you could connect with different people and find your kind of allies, I think. Thank you very much. And Josiah, what would, what would your advice be to, to another organisation that, that came to you and said, we, we want to set up a, a gender budgeting group, how should we go about it? Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, for me, it's very important. Um, and as I work on some of the things that Fiona said, just to understand your context, because we are operating in different forms of um, communities and governments with different experiences politically and, and, and socially. So it's very important to ad uh, understand your context. What works um, in another region might not work for your country. So understanding the context is very important because then it, it, it informs you on, on how um, you're going to engage the different actors. Uh, so the second thing is, is, is understanding the gaps. What are the gaps in, in, in gender responsive budgeting? We have realized like in our context, there, there's some good work that has gone in the past in developing guidelines. But the follow-up and, and you know the sustained advocacy and the coordination of it um, around uh, the GRB is not done so well. So that, that then therefore be, that becomes an issue for us. Uh, so what are the gaps in 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 in, the, in, the, in those other contexts that, that these are, these these other networks are operating uh, in? It's very important. 
Uh, the next thing is who are the actors? I think it's very important to um, classify the actors in the budget process in uh, just deciding who is the most influential and what, are, what, what advantages do we have uh, that we can engage, uh, which strengths do we have that enable us to engage with these with, with this people? I think it's very important. Uh, recently, we just realized that at a very uh, uh, sub-national level, not even at the national level, there are um, budget uh, committees and, and 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 we realized that the chair the chair the chair people the chair the, the person the, the persons that had those those committees actually very powerful and they hold a lot of sway in how budgets are are, are developed so then therefore those become our target audience with some of these messages and engagement um, um are towards a gender responsive budgeting so uh, i think context and then gaps and then who are the actors um, that that will be something uh, great to look at uh, for any budgeting network. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to me that actually those answers were were quite similar. You know, it's the same sets of questions about you know what's the situation you're dealing with, what are your resources, what you know, who are your allies, all of those things. Um, it, it often comes back to those those same things, even though the situations are very very different. Um, I'm conscious of how freezing cold it is in this room. For those of you who are watching online, it is cold. Sorry? Oh, somebody's got their hand up. Sorry, I didn't see that. Diane. Diane. Oh, we've got a few people with their hands up. Sorry, Tiffy, you're going to have to shout at me and tell me. <laughs> no problem. It's, it's difficult, I know. Um, yeah, so... Hi, Diane. Your yeah. question? Yeah, well, I just wanted to um, pick up on the point that Josiah made about the importance of following up when guidelines have been established, because I know this happens has happened in a lot of countries. Guidelines have been established, but they're not actually been followed through to reshape budgets. And it's a bit like in the UK when we've got the, the rule that says you're supposed to have an equalities impact assessment. But as we know, either it's not done or it's not done properly and it isn't actually taken. It's always an after the policy has been decided, not as an ingredient into uh, developing the policy. So I do think this is where civil society budget groups can be really, really important to make sure that if guidelines are developed or a law that says you've got to have equalities impact assessments uh, is passed, it doesn't just stop there, that there's well-informed, well-organized civil society groups uh, that are following up on that and asking questions about it and they're arming people with the data and the, the knowledge that they need to, to really press for that. So I find this very exciting session. I'm very impressed uh, with what I've heard. It's very heartening uh, to see these things um, uh, really being developed so that it can move uh, from government saying on the page we've got some guidelines or we've got a law that says there should be an impact assessment to actually pressure from the grassroots to make them do that and take it into account in the decision making. So very, very interesting. Uh, thank you, Diane. That's really, that's really good. Tafisa, is there anybody else who's got their hand? No. Raised. Okay, Fiona, you wanted to come back on that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Diane there because what we've done our final main ask in our report with one day is to say we would like a women's economy board within the combined authority. It's a big ask, um, and the reason why we want that is because we want to be able to hold them accountable to the changes that we are going to work with them on um, and to make. And exactly that, you know, I really. I'm confident that we'll be able to make some changes, but we can write anything down, but when we go back and check 12 months later, has it actually happened is really important. So yeah, I would, I would build that into any, any list that you might have, any plans that you might have is how are you going to then hold people accountable. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to ask for some final remarks from the panel, um, starting with Emily. I'll do it in the order in which you first spoke. 
Um, oh, I don't know. I don't have much else to say. Um, data's great. Um, yeah, come along to the local data project trainings, read the briefings, get in touch if you've got ideas for topics that you would like us to explore in the future. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I just I just want to say thank you to Fiona for agreeing to come along to speak on the panel because what what the one day team has done is really I think it's going to inspire lots of other groups of women around the country to do the same. And I think that your, your last point about having something to hold people accountable is so important. So yeah, that's my final comments. Yeah, no. Thank you. Um, it, I, I suppose I'm gonna, I was just looking at, I wrote a blog um, for the Women's Budget Group, which has just got went on yesterday, and I'm just looking at that final second to last less, second to last paragraph that I wrote, um, and it is it's words from Erica as well, so it's a combination, it's a collaborative piece of work, but um, you know, and she really says challenging systemic gender bias in our workplaces and public services is really hard, and asking those tough questions about funding, about money, and economics. It's not an easy thing to do for most of us. It does kind of resonate with your comment about maths, GCSE maths girls generally tend to shy away from it. But I cannot thank the Women's Budget Group enough um, for the project, you know, the, the body of research that you've got that we know we can use and use as examples of how it should be done is there. Um, and we, you've given us the confidence and the you know, tools um, to challenge what we know in our gut isn't right, but, but now we feel like we've got allies to help us do that as well, which has been brilliant. So thank you for your, you know, for, for doing that for us, really. That is such a wonderful thing to hear. Thank you. Um, Hannah, do you have any final remarks? Anything else you'd like to say? Um, not really. Similarly to Emily, I just want to say thank you. I could talk talk all day about the global partnerships and learning program but it's much more powerful for you to hear it from Josiah and any of our other partners so that you can see what kind of work we've been doing and the impact that it's had so I just want to say thank you to Josiah for joining us this evening from Kenya and for everyone and to everyone for listening. Josiah I'll give the final word to you. Yeah uh, thank you it's, it's great that I'm coming straight after Hannah uh, because I really want to thank her and, and Mario really for all the requests that we have been making to them and, and how they have uh, guided and, and help us, helped, helped us to plan. Even as we reinvigorate the Kenya Gender Budgeting Network and uh, gender responsive budgeting movement um, in a whole. So I, I'm really grateful to the WBG uh, for, for this uh, great initi initiative. And just to see how uh, your work is impacting on, on, on different people um, ac across the world. I was in a meeting yesterday and uh, Oxfam was launching the, um, the, 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 the care, the care uh, policy scorecard. And uh, I had uh, WBG being mentioned as having participated in, 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 in some aspect of that uh, care policy scorecard. And I was very happy to, um, uh, to, to know that, 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 that such, you, you're part of such a great initiative and we'll be reaching out to Oxfam in Kenya in the next uh, few weeks to see how uh, we, can, we can also uh, support uh, you know, more responsive uh, care, care, care uh, policies and, and, and also investment by government uh, to support the care economy. So uh, this, this, this is great work and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to the whole WBG uh, board and, and the staff who are really putting a lot of work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I'd really like to thank all of the panel. Um, it's been a really, really fabulous and inspiring um, event. I felt really just kind of blown away by all the different things that are going. You know, you, you kind of know what's going on, but you don't always hear it in that much detail. And, and it's, um, it's really brilliant to hear. And I think it's really good actually to bring together that local and those local and international sites because you can see where the points of, of similarity are. Um, and I hope for, for members and people attending the AGM, that's given you a bit more detail, you know, when we talk about these projects, exactly what it means and exactly what sort of impacts that it's had. So um, uh, 
Thank you very much for that. And I would also like to particularly thank Tafisa, who has managed um, the first virtual event, uh, the first hybrid event that Women's Budget Group has done, um, absolutely magnificently. Um, it's been incredibly smooth. You know, everything's worked brilliantly. Um, and thank you very much. And thanks to Rose as well. Thank you for We're going to finish up now so that people can go and get warm <laughs> in this room and are, as you may see on the screen, putting our coats on. So to everybody here in the room and to everybody in the virtual meeting, thank you all very, very much. And um, you can stay in touch with all of our projects on our website and find out about other events you can come to, reports to read and so on. Thank you. Bye-bye.